So last time we uh, said injection molding, which involves uh, melting a plastic and then injecting it under pressure into a cavity, which we call it a mold. And that's the desired shape that we want. And then we let it solidify and then we eject it from the machine. We uh, checked some of the, uh, like we studied some of the mechanical parts uh, in, in a regular injection molding. And then we get to the point that there are four parameters uh, that they are important and we need to uh, set them right in order to get a good uh, part by injection molding. Uh, one of those parameters was the time that it requires to uh, fill basically a mold, which is easy, depends on the flow rate that we have. Uh, but uh, more important was the uh, force that we need to clamp basically uh, two half of the molds during an injection molding. That's an important parameter because knowing that the amount of force we need, then we can design the hydraulics. And also we calculated the uh, time like the formula one by combining other parameters. And we got to this uh, formula, which gives us the time required to fill a mold in an injection molding, uh, basically part, plastic injection molding parts. All right, this is what, uh, what we were in the last uh, lecture. So another important parameter for us is how long does it take for the plastic to solidify and um, it's the right time to open up the two half of a mold and then two halves of the mold and we eject basically the part. Because if we uh, eject it too soon, maybe the plastic is still soft and then it's gonna deform. Um, or if we just wait too long, then we are wasting time, all right? So we say um, the cooling time the, or the required cooling time, let's define it first. We say that this is the um, basically the required time until the uh, center line temperature of a part to reach to the ejection uh, uh, temperature. But what do I mean exactly by that? Let's say similar to last time, uh, consider a very simple case and let's say um, a portion of our mold, maybe something like that. Just showing the section of the mold, which let's say inside this mold, there is this um, plastic, which is in a form of fluid, right? So this is the then plastic plastic fluid, right? And then this is the mold, right? And so let's say for again, simplicity, we are considering a very simple rectangular shape. This is the center line, center line. So if we say that the uh, temperature that we need to eject a plastic is T ejection, then I will write the cooling time. We define it as the time uh, required until the center line of the Molten plastic to reach to its uh, ejection temperature. And this ejection temperature depends on the material, depends on the plastic. We can look it up uh, on. Uh, tables and we find out, for example, if you are using ABS, what is the right temperature to eject the material? So uh, by right temperature, uh, we pass, let's say it is of course less than the glass temperature. So the material has been solid enough so we can eject it without damaging the part. And we can find it for different materials on uh, uh, table properties. 
So the mechanism that this uh, plastic is gonna uh, sort of, its temperature is gonna decrease is uh, of course from the mechanism from here, we can say it's gonna be by conduction through the um, solid mold, right? The temperature is gonna go out because it's in, inside an uh, enclosure basically. There is no flow or anything else. So the only way for temperature is by transferring the temperature, the heat through the wall. So in that sense, we can write down the equation for temperature. If T is the temperature, the change in temperature as a function of time at any point is equal to, again, um, a review if you uh, forget your um, heat transfer course. Uh, I guess most of you either pass it last year or maybe this semester you have it. So we just need a basic equation, K rho CP, and then the second derivative of temperature with Y squared, which as we defined it last time, let's say if this is the center line Let's call that one X and then Y is gonna be that direction. So let's call it X and this is the Y direction, all right? So that's basically the equation that we have, which shows the change in temperature as a, uh, like a, as a function of time and also geometry. So here we, oh, sorry. Let's move back. Here we have some constant. Um, so let's, let me walk you through this constant. I guess most of you remember from heat transfer. So rho is obvious is that's the density. And the unit usually is kilogram per cube meter. So that's obvious. Um, then we get, we get to K. K, we call it thermal conductivity. Thermal conductivity. And the unit usually we use is uh, watt meter and then degree Celsius. Right? That's the unit we use. And if you again forget, uh, K was the amount of heat that um, we can say pass through a volume, unit volume, a material in one second, right? So it shows how fast temperature can uh, pass through a material. And then we have CP, which is, uh, uh, which is called um, specific heat. Also, it has another name um, some people call it heat capacity. All right, which uh, we can say for this one, the unit uh, it's normally the SI unit is joule uh, per kilogram and degree Celsius, all right? So the way that we define CP is how much heat we need to increase the temperature of uh, a volume, uh, sorry, one kilogram of something, one degree. So how much heat we need to increase its temperature by one degree. K is the thermal conductivity. It's, it's, it's a measure of how fast the temperature can pass through a material, right? So uh, usually we combine all of these and we call it alpha by K over rho CP. Let me write it better. We call all of it, all of it because it's a constant. It uh, depends on the material property and it has a name, it's called uh, thermal diffusivity. So thermal diffusivity. Again, shows sort of the mm, acceleration or how fast the temperature passed through a material and dissipate. 
So for, uh, let's say for plastic, uh, because our discussion is around plastic, K is usually in a range of, just to give you an idea, 0 0.1. So the number is not that big, 0 0.1 watt uh, degree Celsius. So this W is watt. And CP is usually in range of um, 1,000 or 2,000. Right? That's the number usually we talk about. Right? So these are the three constants. So using that, my equation then becomes simpler, but it's still ugly. That's a partial differential equation. So second derivative of derivative of T with time is alpha and I guess um, nowadays the uh, mechanical engineering has changed, believe it or not, compared with the time that when I was in un my undergrad doing mechanical engineering. In our time, it was uh, like a thick box, lots of ugly equations and the premise at that time was mechanical mechanical engineering is is difficult it's yeah, you have to deal with ugly dry courses um, but now it's 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 we're getting to a point which we try to make courses more fun uh, showing videos um, but believe it or not the manufacturing course that uh, I had is totally different it was lots of lots of equations. However, um, things has changed, technology has changed, um, but still you need to know a little bit of equations. And uh, as, as you notice so far, uh, we use some equations that you've learned in the past, like last lecture, you saw the Navier-Stokes equations, today the heat transfer equation. And uh, as we go further, you will see uh, other equations that some of it you've seen in some other courses, but I try to simplify it. So in fact, more emphasize on the main parameters. So you get a better understanding of the main parameters. All right, so uh, now we have, a, we have an equation. It's a partial differential equation. We need um, some information to be able to solve it. Uh, so those information we can, uh, for example, say the initial temperature so let me write it down here. Where is my pen? Okay, here. Let me also draw a, draw a line here so we don't mix these things together. Okay, so to solve it, we need initial temperature and BC, not British Columbia, boundary conditions, right? So uh, of course our initial temperature is uh, TM, uh, the uh, melt temperature of the plastic that we uh, injected into the, um, basically into the mold. So TM, uh, like melt temperature. So Te is the final temperature or the ejection temperature. This is something that we decide, right? We decide at this point, at this temperature, when the temperature gets to that point, so Tm decreased, got to Te, that's the eject basically time, time for ejection. And what else we need? Oh, in terms of boundary condition, let's call it TW, uh, the wall temperature. Wall temperature of the molds. All right, so that's where the plastic and mold touch each other, that's boundary condition. Using that, if we solve that equation, we will find the time that we need to um, eject basically these um, plastic. So T, let's call it T cooling. It is expected 
do not expect a nice equation. H squared divided by 10 over alpha. So what is H here? We are not done with the equation. So H is the thickness. Let me write it down here maybe better. So that's H, okay? And then we have ln uh, logarithm of four over pi. So that's the logarithm, right? Ln. Somebody last year asked me, what is L, what is N? That's logarithm, Nepper logarithm. Four over P, like four over pi, sorry, multiplied by Tm minus Tw divided by Te minus Tw. All right. And this is an important e equation that we should have in our uh, handbook. If we are working in a factory uh, or we are studying uh, basically uh, injection molding, all right? So, and, and in this equation, uh, H is the thickness. Uh, we know Tm, Tw, and Te. Alpha depends on the uh, property of the plastic, rho density, its thermal conductivity, and its specific heat. Okay? Any questions so far, guys? Yeah, doesn't the um, like wall temperature, like is that maintained at a certain level, like when you inject the um, molten plastic or like wouldn't that kind of not be a constant, like transient? Yeah, Th thanks uh, Grant. That's a good question. So Grant is asking if uh, this, this TM is not a constant, that's a good point. It's Yes, it's not constant, it's a transient temperature. So we assume like the average temperature. So at the beginning, let's say it is before injecting, it is the room temperature. And then when we inject it at the plastic, so we assume it gets to the molten temperature. So we say, uh, so the average temperature of the, uh, basically the mold. And also if you notice, we use a very simple, basically mold just for a cube and it is, an estimation, right? Sometimes in practice, it involves a lot of trial and error, but that's usually a good start for people to know if they have a certain shape, what is the, like approximately uh, the time that they need to open up the two halves, halves of a mold, okay? So to answer your question, that's the, it's not a transient, it's not also constant, we know, so it is the average temperature. Right. So if um, there is no question, let's solve one quick example together. And of course, it's just substituting some numbers. Um, so let's see what it says. Uh, we are injecting PP into a box of L, W, and H. We have the size and it says the pressure dropped by this amount, we want to estimate the cooling time and we have all these parameters, right? So of course we don't, for this one, we don't need any of those um, pressure and other information. Maybe this was part of, I believe example two, that's why we have those extra parameters. The rest, we have the rest of information that we want. We just need to substitute so T cooling is gonna be H. So let's maintain the unit. Otherwise we're gonna get a very weird number. So meter 10 alpha, I calculate alpha here, which is K rho CP and we have everything. And luckily they are all in SI unit. So we get alpha from there and then ln 
4 pi. And we have the rest of information, 250 minus uh, the wall temperature divided by uh, ejection temperature. I believe when I calculated this, yeah, do, do the calculation yourself, use uh, your calculator. Anyway, so uh, it should be, you should get a number around three seconds, I believe. If you're getting a very large number or small number, I think something is not right. So, and, and in injection molding, that's the uh, sort of the longest processing time for injection mode. That's, uh, that's this cooling part that uh, created delay in injection mode. Injection molding usually is super fast, but the cooling time is the one that creates delay. Still not bad for this one. And uh, somebody asked last, I guess it was Kuthan, the last session after the lecture, he asked, is there just, we let it to cool off um, by air? Uh, and the answer is most of the time, but in some advanced machines, there are like uh, water circulating around the, the mold. However, those are very expensive and maintaining them is costly. It's more like a radiator type that you run uh, chilled water or regular water around or inside the, the mold. So you need to add those features around the mold to make it cool faster. All right, so, so far we learned how much force we need to basically clamp to uh, have of a mold, how much time it takes to fill up the mold. We calculate the drop in pressure into a very simple uh, rectangular mold. And also we calculate the time that we need um, to eject or to let the plastic solidify before we eject it, all right? Um, now let's get to um, some of the uh, things that may go wrong uh, if we don't set any of these parameters right. So two very common uh, problems in injection molding, one is void and another one is flash. So simply void is when uh, the amount of pl plastic is less than it, the amount that it should be, all right? So, um, in fact, there is not enough pressure because uh, the shot size that you use was a small, all right? And if you recall the shot size, last lecture we said is the, uh, you add the volume of the mold, the, the part, the volume of the runners, the volume of the sprue, all of that we consider the shot size. So if the shot size is small, then uh, of course there's not gonna be enough pressure. So you cannot fill up the, the mold and you, you should expect some uh, cavity and void in some places. What if the amount of plastic is more than we need? So then the plastic tries to get out, right? Somewhere. And the best place is, is the gaps between two molds, even if may, may keep a tight tolerance, it's still the tiny because the pressure is high and plastic gets out of those gaps and create uh, something which we call it flash. In some injected molding parts, maybe around you, if you notice, especially cheaper one, you can see that line, which we call it a mold line to, to have our molds come together in some, this line is very, invisible, very tiny in some cheaper parts, it's larger and maybe it's because there was an issue with a flash. If the temperature, if we increase the temperature more than we should, then uh, degradation is something that we should expect. It's usually called burning degradation. This is where the property of plastic change. Sometimes there is discoloration, sometimes the, even it's mechanical property change that it's not good. So uh, it's called burning degradation. And then material degradation, again, it is, um, can be because of high speed, uh, injecting too fast or high temperature. 
uh, which again may result in material degradation. We are not happy with some of these property. So this, these are like a common uh, problem that can go wrong when we do inject, uh, injection molding. Is there any question guys so far? All right, it's not. So you, you've seen based on the things that can go wrong, right? We have control over some of these parameters. Of course, we can control uh, the amount of plastic that we send into the mold. Um, in a way, we can control pressure if the amount of uh, plastic or the shot size is small, the pressure drop, we, it result in void. If the amount of plastic is too, too much, then the pressure goes, uh, again goes up and then we result, it result in flash. So it shows that with injection molding, the temperature and the pressure and the amount of plastic, they has to be just right. So you cannot go further or lower than a certain temperature. And there is something with each plastic injection molding that we call it process window. Like as you can guess, that's the window that we can operate without getting to any uh, basically prop. Let's, uh, this X and Y graph, let's call the X axis pressure and the Y axis temperature. All right. So in terms of temperatures, we know that the, um, there is a red line um, for temperature. And we shouldn't pass that temperature because we are going to expect um, thermal degradation. Let's call it above this line, thermal degradation. So that's for sure. Depends again on the material, we cannot pass this line. And what about lower temperature? So that's obvious. If we go too low, then uh, we cannot melt the plastic, right? So then let's say approximately a line like that. And this line, let's call it the melting temperature. And we know that the melting, as the pressure increase, the melting point also is going to increase slightly. That's why this is not a straight line, it's a slope. So also we talk about the, um, an important parameter, which is the amount of plastic, the shot size, because if the shot size is a small, we are going to experience void. Uh, and if the shot size is high, we're going to experience high pressure and then flash. So then I can roughly draw two lines, two curves like that. And on the left side of this line, we will write a small shot size, which result in void. Or better to say, result in low pressure. And we know low pressure is result in void. And more than enough, let's say um, big shot size. So big shot size, you're going to get drunk, right? No. Not that shot. So high pressure. And then flash. So flash here. Okay. So um, 
then we can conclude that the green area or the area that we are going to get a good part is inside this window. And luckily for each material, we can find such a window, which is called the process window. And sometimes depends on the material, this window is very tiny. It means we have to keep a very tight tolerance, um, maybe few degree, and we have to be very accurate. And again, it depends on the size of the part that we are designing, the quality that we want and so on. But in general, that's the rule. And sort of you learned, um, so calculating the uh, volume, the shot size, sort of easy. It depends on the geometry and you can do a good job of that. The uh, thermal degradation, you can avoid it by, based on the material that you have, finding the right temperature and also finding the right ejection temperature. Okay, so that's sort of is a summary, like this temperature uh, or process in the summary of the parameters that involves in injection molding. Is there any question guys so far? Um, I'm wondering, isn't the shot size controlled by how far the screw moves when it's uh, doing the injection step? So, Thanks, Jesse. So Jesse is asking the shot size, uh, is it the amount that the screw moves? So of course it's, we know like in the process you've seen, first the screw starts rotating, right? It starts rotating until the plastic inject sort of get to the screw. Then the way that the mechanical part works is a valve that release this rotation and then it's gonna be a hydraulic pressing that amount of plastic into the mold. So there are some calculation involves uh, that how much this, like the screw has to rotate based on the geometry that it has. So we get to that amount of plastic before getting to the mold, because it is at that point that it's not the rotation that inject the plastic into the mold. The rotation get the plastic up to the sprue point, all right? And then there's a valve release and then there is a hydraulic that press everything and inject plastic in one shot into the mold. So there are some calculation involved. Um, I guess in your textbook, it explained this mechanism that I just explained with some nice uh, figures, uh, which give you a better idea, with some nice graphics. All right, Jesse? Thank you. So now we're getting to the design part, all right? That's the fun part for a mechanical engineer who doesn't like to do manufacturing, rather he likes to do the design. But again, as you remember, similar to other modules, and at, as I said at the very beginning, although you don't want to do the design, uh, the manufacturing, you should know as a designer how things are made and know some like, little things about it so when you design it, then you end up with a good design. So I, uh, let's move to, to my uh, document camera. So this uh, cube, um, I'm not sure if somebody had a chance to order it and get it. Um, anybody, no? Who um, order it? I've got Look one. at the uh, people who have their cameras on. So they have it. All right. So that's good. All right. So probably if you order it, um, you'll get it uh, soon. Um, yeah, but this year because of COVID, uh, uh, I guess maybe there is a delay and for outside country, maybe there is a problem. Anyway, so not, not a big deal, but there are some cool features on it. Uh, so first of all, you can... Uh, open it up uh, like that. So that's the inside, see some feature inside. Uh, so first it shows like with one shot, one inject, uh, you can build it. So you can include this hinge here, right? So it is flexible, it can move and you can move it many times and nothing bad is gonna happen. That's the nice things about it. And also you may, can maintain like a tight tolerance. So you include these uh, basically uh, clips there, right? 
So you can include those clips there as well. Like this one. So that's Port Labs. And let's see, for example, here it says uh, like between these two, I'm not sure if on the camera you can see, uh, probably if I, yeah, maybe better. So this is like hollow, this one is solid. So it, it takes a longer time to fill up the whole area, like the whole volume here, while this one is solo, uh, like hollow, sorry, hollow inside. And this one results in something which you call it sink. Uh, either not enough material getting to the core, or maybe um, we got enough material to the core, but when we eject things, still the inside was uh, like hot and it shrinked, right? If I open it up again, every time I forget. Here, okay, yeah, so you see this is the hollow one, that's that one, and this is the solid one. And then it shows the, like how much time it takes for cooling off. So it's important to maintain different thickness. You go from this thickness to that thickness. This is like the amount of time that you need to let it to solidify, all right? But other feature in design, let's look at the uh, bottom of it, like this part here. Uh, so it suggests like rather than using a, like a, let's say you need a, something here for a bracket to screw it there, instead of a solid uh, cylinder like that, which create a thick thickness, why not using a, maybe a rib and then this portion there? or maybe something like that. This one create the same strength as that one, right? Same size for the hole. So the hole, same size, but this one has the rib. This one doesn't have the rib. Or this one, like a lot of plastic there, but on this corner, the same function, instead you use a rib and make it hollow like that. Right. So you can find the other features around it. And I believe they sent also a notebook with this one, uh, something called, um, I'm not sure if I have it around, um, the uh, injection molding for dummies, which is a, like a nice small engineering book as well. So getting back to this here. Anyway, my point is, uh, as I wrote here, depends on the complexity of the, the part that you have. Uh, uh, you need to consider ramps uh, in your design, ribs, as you've seen that, and uh, also uniform thickness is a big thing. Um, I remember three of my students from last year, 392, um, like in summer, they design something for like for can of beers to automatically open up. Uh, so because of COVID, they don't want people to touch their, their can when like in a bar. And uh, they design something, they put it on a website or somewhere and they receive a lot of attention and, uh, and some bars order their like this device. They need to basically build the base by injection molding. They contacted me for the various process that they uh, consider and they decided to do it by injection molding. They send their design to the company um, for injection molding and the company return it back and says, change your design because of the thickness. Uh, it's not uniform or some parts which had some issue. Anyway, so maybe at some point I will show you that part as well. All right, but let's quickly review some of the things which are essential. The first one is a draft angle. So draft angle is like this little angle you see on this image. And the main purpose is we want to like to help the plastic to come out of the mold, right? So 
roughly we say, uh, this is like recommended, not necessarily one degree and the draft angle to be one degree. And if it is uh, like it has texture for a smooth surface, for texture surface, then at least three degree. So that's draft angle, it's a must. If you get to the negative um, draft angle, you know what you expect, right? It's impossible to get out these things out. So as I said, and as you've seen in that image, so this is bad. If it's possible, uh, take the core out, right? Consider it in your design. So sorry, this one is bad. Uh, sorry, can you just go back up to that last slide quickly? Yep, yep. Thanks. So that's uh, the draft angle, the angle that we need to consider in our design. So when you design your geometry, of course, as a mechanical engineer at the beginning, you just consider your geometry. When you finalize it and when you want to send it to the uh, manufacturer, you need to modify your geometry and consider this draft angle for all the walls. It's not just for one, let's say whatever shape that you have, you need to consider this angle. Right? Like you see in this simple cup, uh, it's easy to consider it, but for more complicated shape, like this one, you know, it's a lot of work. Okay. Uh, by texture, do you mean that the surface is rough or is there oh, something surface is on rough. the surface? Surface is rough. The surface is not smooth. Then you need a bigger angle to eject the part. All right. So this one, um, I guess, sort of clear. You need to hollow out the core. The same concept, if it's possible uh, for your design, rather than going with this design, uh, consider some ribs in the example that I just showed you. And you've seen in some points, if it's possible, uh, you do that or maybe you end up with more creative design. However, you need to consider the injection molding like this one, instead of making it hollow like that, consider some parallel holes around it, but that's gonna make it more challenging. But you will see, you see this one, like both here, like on this section, rather than having a solid core, we prefer To do the, oh, I cannot pick that one. Okay. Prefer to go there. And rather than a solid core like that one, we prefer to do this design. Uh, this cannot be done in one shot, right? Uh, in injection molding, if uh, it can be done, if you, um, let's say you design your two half of the molds to be in this plane. Let's say this is your plane. sort of the center plane, consider the center plane. Yeah, each half of the molds, so they are symmetric, it's like that, and you can do it. All right, Ahmed, is it clear? Yep, thank you. So Ahmed is asking if we can do it in one shot. Yes, we can. And if you're uh, like the center plane, by center plane, I mean the, the, the molding line which the two half of the molds, which for this one can be symmetric. So these are some general guidelines for different materials. If depends on the material that you pick, this is the range that has been recommended by industry based on the experience that they have. For example, if you go for, uh, let's say uh, polyester, maybe you shouldn't go uh, like the thickness more than uh, let's say one tenth of an inch, all right? Or for ABS, uh, you should stay in this range because smaller this range maybe cause some issue uh, or going uh, larger than that also, uh, that's the solidification time and it's gonna cause some issue. You can keep this one as a reference for yourself 
but you don't need to, of course, memorize the numbers. And then we get to this uh, idea of ramp and fillets. So um, rather than a sudden drop like this one, maybe you'd better to include a ramp like this one. Makes the part stronger, reduce the residual stress and the um, stress concentration. And also you can do a better job if it's possible and like making it hollow on this one. But a better job is to like make it hollow over here as well. Okay. So, but everywhere possible, do not do a sudden jump to consider a ramp. Fillet uh, is obvious. Uh, we don't want like the thickness of the material is here is, is big and it may cause issue. So we like to maintain the same thickness like this one, the thickness over here and here. And over here, they're all the same thickness. Right? And also it makes the part stronger because less stress concentration. And if you have to go with a 90 degree, uh, so definitely consider uh, some uh, ribs and support like this one in your design. Um, I have another example here. Quickly, I will show you. So this is the cup that I, oh, it's black. It maybe cannot be seen easily if I turn on the light, maybe better. Yeah, the plastic cup that I use, um, like a spoon for making coffee in the morning. So this is the spoon that I use. And this part is for my espresso machine. So I press the uh, coffee into the coffee filter. Anyway, so it's, it has been made by uh, injection molding. I can say from these uh, lines that the two half of molds being separated. Over here, if I look around here, so instead of using a lot of plastic and a thick maybe portion over here, if you can see, they consider like a thin plastic, but they consider a rib here. So they save a lot of plastic. And then when we get here, like instead of having the whole area here to be a solid uh, part, what they did, they make it hollow over there. Maybe because it's black, it cannot be seen easily, but yeah. Anyway, so two features that you can check for the parts around you that shows they made by injection molding is, is one this this gap line or the mold line, we call it. And then another feature is maybe uh, the sign for the uh, pins. If you remember from the machine, you need the uh, ejection pins to eject the parts out, which are these two parts. So let's move back. We are almost done. Let's see what left. Tolerance. So with plastic, there is a problem with uh, shrinkage. After the plastic solidifies, it shrinks a little bit. So then uh, we are not going to get the exact size that we intended at the beginning. Uh, so this is a range usually we say. And remember, this is in one inch. Again, this is based on the practical um, and experimental things that people did. This is the tolerance you should expect. That's relatively uh, a nice tight tolerance, two thousands of an inch per inch. Um, yeah, but that's something that you need to consider in your design. And we had the same uh, table in lecture three I gave you for the material selections. Uh, that one was more complete. This one also, you can keep it as a reference. These uh, eight uh, plastics are very common in injection molding. And each of them you can consider for, depends on the application that you have. So you'd better know a few of them. So if somebody asks somewhere during an interview uh, or just for yourself, for example, if you are designing something that uh, you want it to be chemical resistance. Uh, let's say you want to 
a container or something that you want to put acid or something chemically in it, then maybe PP is a, is a nice material. Um, if you are designing something that is impact resistance, then you go for ABS and so on. So that table, but a more comprehensive table was the one that I gave you in lecture, I believe three. And uh, we are almost done. Two more things. One is insert molding. Insert molding is, is when we need to have, let's say a metal part inside the plastic. A good example is when we need a thread into a plastic because plastic cannot really withstand a uh, large force. If we create a thread into the plastic, then uh, um, we are gonna end up, the threads are gonna wear off and uh, we are gonna end up with a bad part. So uh, you see this like maybe fan blades or propeller, I'm not sure if it was part of a toy or something, or this one, uh, like inside there are brass thread bush. So it ensures us that we don't need to use a strong plastic because the difficult job is being done by the brass and then the rest, we, the rest we can keep the weight down. For the examples such as the USB adapter or the USB um, thumbnail, which uh, we talk about it, also um, insert molding uh, is the process to make them. So the way that they do it and why they call it insert molding, because you uh, insert the uh, metal part before injecting, you put it inside the mold. So it is there inside the mold and then you inject plastic. So and the plastic uh, is gonna solidify around it and create that bounding, all right? And so this is called insert molding Another type is overmolding. Uh, overmolding is uh, when we need, um, let's say, two types of plastic in one application and we want to do it in one shot. Good examples again, maybe toothbrush uh, brushes or uh, like here uh, on my uh, like Microsoft economic uh, mouse like this portion for better grip and being soft is like a soft material, but the rest are hard. Um, so I'm guessing most likely they've done use the uh, over molding. But a better example is the uh, toothbrush. Um, I have it on my table. So you can imagine, try to be good hygiene. No, I just brought it here, it was a good example. So this usually this, uh, the handle is hard, but for a better grip like this portion, uh, of course you cannot feel it. It is, it is very soft, like not very soft, but soft for a better grip or this portion is soft. In fact, it's very soft. And so uh, the over molding is the process to make it. Let's move back, okay. And you can read more about it in your textbook. Uh, um, you don't need to read all the details, but at least take a look at the schematic or of the, the machine that produce, uh, let's say, over molding. You don't need to read again all the details, just um, skim through the pages and look at the images and the schematics of the machinery. It gives you some good idea. And lastly, because I uh, remember somebody um, last session asked if we do injection molding only for plastic, the answer is no. Metal also, uh, we use injection molding for some particular application with metals because with metals, it can be very, very difficult for injection molding. However, for some particular applications, usually they uh, instead of melting the metal, because you need them to maintain a very, very high temperature and it's almost impossible. Um, what they do, they use powder, metal powder. They mix it with uh, uh, some sort of polymer or wax. And people usually use the same uh, injection molding uh, machine. And uh, 
yeah, they use it for metal. But again, certain application, when we get to the module, when we talk about the powder metallurgy, we come back to this idea. But I included this one here, again, because somebody asked if the injection molding is uh, only for plastic, we say, no, it can be also be done for metal as well. Right? So that's it guys for um, this module.